Our medications are a valuable tool in the management of ADHD and NICE guidance recommends medication in patients with severe or moderate impairment where non-drug measures have either been ineffective or cannot be attempted. Um, they will tend to be used together with the previous supportive measures and the most commonly used ones are the stimulants uh, methylphenidate, dexamphetamine and atoxamatine. Um, other medications such as imipramine and bupropion, they're used off-label for the management of ADHD if the commonly used medications have been ineffective or not tolerated. Now an area for concern for patients is abuse, potential and addiction of stimulant medication. Patient, pa parents also worry about subsequent risk of other drug abuse. However, there's no evidence that ADHD medication is addictive or that taking stimulants will cause someone to try illicit drugs when they're older. In fact, taking medication can be protective as patients are less likely then to self-medicate. So if we just look through some of these medications. So methylphenidate is the most commonly used stimulant medication for the management of ADHD. It tends to have a response rate between 70 to 85 percent um, and is therefore regarded as highly effective. It works by blocking the reuptake of dopamine and possibly noradrenaline into the nerve endings in the brain. Um, they work very quickly in a matter of hours but their full effects may take a few weeks. Methylphenidate does have maximum licensed daily doses but um, higher doses can be used off-label and it is actually supported by NICE guidance if it's required. Modified release tablet preparations need to be swallowed whole. They can pose a problem for younger patients who find it difficult to swallow solid dosage forms. The capsule preparations may be swallowed whole, but for patients with swallowing difficulties, they can be opened and the contents emptied into a small amount of soft food, such as yogurt or applesauce, and then taken immediately. Patients mustn't chew it, and it's a good practice to drink some fluids afterwards to ensure the patient gets the full dose. Now, due to the differences in release profile of the modified release medication, these capsule preparations must be prescribed by brand and they're not equ um, equivalent. The 12-hour tablet preparations are deemed to be bioequivalent, but some patients and parents um, notice a difference if they switch between them, so they must be prescribed by brand. If a prescription for a modified release preparation is written generically, the pharmacy team must ascertain the patient's usual brand. Where possible, the parent should be sorry, the patient should be maintained on a modified release preparation. It's, um, the advantage is a once daily administration um, and therefore um, removing the need for an afternoon dose in school, which can be problematic for school and patients. Now, the next medication that can be used is dexamphetamines. That's another stimulant um, medication and it's indicated for re refractory ADHD and therefore reserved as a second line treatment. It is effective um, since 80% of patients who fail to respond to methylphenidate will respond to dexamphetamine. It works by blocking the reuptake of dopamine and noradrenaline back into the nerve endings in the brain and stimulates the release of those two neurotransmitters into the synapse. The onset of action is 1-2 to two hours and the duration of action is up to 13 hours. There are various strengths um, of the capsules and the capsules can be swallowed whole. For patients with swallowing difficulties, the capsule can be opened similarly and emptied onto soft food. Um, and the usual maximum daily dosage of dexamphetamine is 20 milligrams, although some older patients have needed 40 milligrams. The maximum daily dosage of another type of um, dexamphetamine, known as LIS dexamphetamine, is 70 milligrams. Atomexetine, um, which is a brand name of the brand name is Stratera, is a non-stimulant medication. It works by inhibiting the reuptake of noradrenaline and the advantage is that it provides up to 24 hours of cover and therefore lowers the risks of ticks and less potential for drug use. The side effect profile can be more favourable compared to stimulants. The major drawback is that it can take four weeks to start working and may take up to three months to have a full effect. So during the start of the treatment, the clinician may decide to overlap with methylphenidate and then slowly withdraw the methylphenidate. Uh, but some patients may be on the combination treatment continuously. Combination treatment is off-label and the patient will need to be carefully monitored. Um, atomoxetine is available in capsules of various strengths and also as oral solution. So um, because of its long duration of action, it should only be given once daily in the morning. If tolerability, tolerability or response is not satisfactory, then the dose can be split to be given in the morning and late afternoon or early evening.
And the last medication you'll most probably see is melatonin, and that's a hormone produced by the pineal gland, the production of which is suppressed by light and stimulated by darkness. It's thought to regulate the wake-sleep pattern. So melatonin may be prescribed in patients with ADHD if their insomnia is causing daytime impairment. Um, it has been shown to reduce sleep onset latency, so the time taken to go to sleep by around 20 minutes and increases sleep duration by 15 to 20 minutes. But studies have really failed to demonstrate how this translates into better daytime ADHD symptom control, behaviour or quality of life. Despite that, it is widely used in ADHD. Um, it should, however, be used after careful consideration on a case-by-case -case basis. It is available as a licensed product. Um, its use in children and in adolescents is off-label. Um, where possible, clinicians will use the modified release tablet as it carries the least prescribing risk to it to being a licensed preparation. All other preparations are unlicensed. If we consider the side effects and monitoring, so there's considerable overlap in side effect profiles and monitoring requirements between medications. Um, overall, ADHD medications are well tolerated. Most of the side effects occur during initiation and with dose increase, increases, and they tend to subside after a week or two. So it's very important with these side effects that they're explained to patients and to parents and advice is given on what to do if they occur so they can persevere through them if possible. Um, firstly, suicide-related behaviour has been reported more frequently in patients taking atomoxetine, although it's still an uncommon occurrence. Uh, parents and patients should be warned to look out for any worrying thoughts or behaviour and seek help as soon as possible. There have been some very rare reports of liver injury. Um, liver function tests are not routinely carried out before initiation of atomoxetine, but parents and patients should be um, counselled to look out for signs of potential liver injury. For example, unexplained nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, dark urine, um, yellow discoloration and they should be reporting any suspicious findings as soon as possible. Parents are often concerned about the long-term effects on growth, so weight and height, but ADHD medication should have a negligible effect. Growth may be slightly less than expected in some patients, but weight and height should be monitored at least every six months so any changes could be picked up and acted upon. Um, studies have shown that patients treated with ADHD medication are no more at risk of sudden death compared to the general population. A routine ECG is not required for starting ADHD medication unless physical examination or family history warrants further investigation. And stimulant and non-stimulant medication can increase blood pressure and heart rate. Therefore, blood pressure should be measured and plotted on centile charts after initiation, dose increases and routinely every, th every three months according to NICE. For stable patients, some areas... Um, may have an arrangement with primary care to do the three-month blood pressure management under shared care arrangements. Others may opt to measure blood pressure for their stable patients every six months, which is the recommendation from the manufacturers of methylphenidate and, and atomoxetine preparations. Now, transition is an important part of a patient's care in this field, so cut-off for transition to adult services can vary across the country, but usually preparations tend to be made when the patient is around 16 years of age and adolescents then transition from around 18 years of age. Before an adolescent is transitioned it is important to explore their views, degree of impairment and future plans and also trying a medication break if deemed clinically appropriate. Now medication breaks or holidays um, they tend to be a controversial area so some clinicians will attempt this while others will not entertain the idea. Some parents tend to medicate their children or adolescents every day of the year while others choose to medicate only during school time. Medication breaks and holidays can have advantages as well as drawbacks so there should be discussion with the parent and possibly the patient around this. So during a transition um, a medication break may be used whilst they are going from one care setting um, or care provider to another.